The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. Marcus with Sean Hackett. Sean Hackett is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida, and he's nice enough to come on and talk about what's happening in the worlds of commodities. So, Sean, how you doing this morning? Good deal, man. Good deal. Well, we had uh, some news come out about wheat that the market wasn't as um, satisfied with what they were seeing in the overall, um, uh, you know, process of progress of of wheat with uh, areas of Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas being drier than expected. Um, I had had some conversations with some folks around the Wichita, Kansas area, and they had all told me that it had it, it was dry enough for long enough that they felt that they've lost anywhere between 25 and even up to 50 percent of the uh, of harvest that they thought they would get uh, yield wise uh, coming into this year. Looking at that, Sean, you were down in that area. Um, I was, I, mean, I, yeah, I was just yeah. in Wichita last week, and um, and, and and you know, although the Midwest has gotten more rainfall this year than, generally speaking, than we got last year, um, that that Texas Oklahoma, especially Texas Oklahoma corridor, they've just been missing it. It was interesting when I was having a discussion uh, with one gentleman, and he says, you know, like certain. 
four or five years ago, you know, prior to the four or five years ago, these big storms that used to come into the to the California, they'd come down and then they would come right through and we get we'd get rain. And what's been happening now is we get like last year, you know, all nine hundred inches of snow, these big storms coming in, and they come around and then they go underneath us and around us, and we keep missing the rain that we would normally have gotten. And I think and what I had mentioned to him, um, and was one of the things we talked about in the presentation at his conference was that, you know, this this quieting sunspot activity and this change in the upper airflow pattern to a much more, you know, north-south undulating jet stream, uh, that's what exactly, it steers those storms exactly what he said, because think of it, it dives right. deep down, yeah. and then it comes back up. So so the storm comes in, it, you know, it goes south of that region, and then it comes back up into the northeast, of course, north, the, the eastern part of the country has had record rainfall this past year, so mm -hmm. they're missing it. And um, and so long as the upper airflow pattern is the way that it is, it looks like they're going to continue to miss it. And obviously, you, know, you can miss it in February. You can miss it in March. You can maybe miss it a little bit in April, but you really can't miss it from mid late April to mid late May. I mean, you, that's when you, that's the gotta have time for moisture, or else you, you know you're going to have permanent uh, yield loss due to lack of moisture. If the elevated risk for frost that we've been talking about verifies here in mid, around mid-May, if, if if that actually delivers, well, then then we can add something else on top of it, and then you could be looking at a crop that could be, you know, really bad. So really? Uh, I'm not wishing that upon any farmer, and I'm not saying this, you know, uh, with uh, clicking my heels or anything, but, you know, we've been talking about the potential. It doesn't have to happen, and quite frankly, I hope it does not happen, but we think there's an elevated risk that uh, frost could happen, and if it if it were to affect, um, um, you know, the the the, the KC winter wheat areas, and you know, we'll see how far south it gets. Maybe it misses Kansas and it catches other parts. But bottom line is, is that if we, if we already are having a core part of KC winter wheat belt in trouble, um, and if we were to throw some frost in some other parts, at least, you know, we could be looking at a significant change in the expectation. Remember, the expectation for this crop, Casey, was way up there, you know, huge crop, big crop. And, and if we have to throttle down to something uh, significantly lower, we're already starting to see the, the, the wheat market starting to uh, get a little uncomfortable that maybe um, they, 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 they've, the, the, the crop hasn't been made yet. The other thing that we've been talking about that's now starting to become an issue is there were some downgrades of the Russian wheat crop yesterday. Not huge, yeah, I saw that. Not, not yeah. huge, not huge, but, but a downgrade. I and mean, we've been upgrading that crop yeah. now for like – six months and i think yesterday mm -hmm. they, they they downgraded the crop by two million metric tons which you know is, is like an eye opener i was like whoa, whoa, whoa you know still still you know if, if it stays at the level it is it's okay but uh we've been warning about this dry weather pattern we think it's going to continue once again like kansas and oklahoma you you can miss rainfall up until the first part of april but mid april mid late april to mid late may the rains have got to deliver and i don't think they are casey I think they're going to miss. I think they're going to miss at least into mid-May, and and we might get some rainfall later in May. But I, I don't think that's going to be enough to. I, mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at. I don't think we're done with the downgrades in the Russian wheat crop. I think we. I think peak production potential was 92 million metric tons. The record I think was 102. By the way, so not that that was a record crop, but it was a good crop. Now we're down to 90. It wouldn't surprise me if 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 our weather out forecast is correct. It would surprise me we moved down to eighty five. And that's not that's oh, not wow. a disaster, yeah. but it's not ninety two. And remember we were with wheat prices yeah. where they are, we are pricing absolute massive perfection. Yeah, bumper, bumper crop does yeah. not and and yeah. if we're gonna start not moving the US crop down millions of metric tons, in the in our case bushels, um, and we're gonna start moving Russia down, remember ending stocks in exporter hands. Are at thirty-five year lows. The only thing keeping the whole thing together is Russia. It's just interesting dynamic here, and we have a lot of geopolitical uh, unrest going on in the Middle East. And on a report that we put out to our subscribers over the weekend, we talked about the history of how wheat is is the number one geopolitical agricultural commodity in terms of how it performs during periods of. Uh, escalating global uh, geopolitical unrest. 
World War One, World War Two, uh, Vietnam War. Um, wheat was just a poster child for outperforming based upon using wheat as a chess piece match in the geopolitical game. You know, it's so important to the to, to at least half the population, if not more, that you know people restrict exports, they stockpile. It, it's just you really you get in a situation where you're not sure about who's going to be willing to trade with you or not. You know, you just, you just stop trading wheat and, and those who don't have it, you know, get into a panic phase, unfortunately. So, so, so the, so the, 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 the recipe here, Casey is for, for the wheat market is, is looking very interesting to me. Um, and you know, we've, we've seen big rallies in gold and silver. We've seen big rallies in Bitcoin. We've seen a big rally in crude oil. You know, these are your classic geopolitical commodities. And up until the last few days, we've seen very almost no movement in wheat. I think this is a sleeper geopolitical asset on top of what's going on with weather. And it could be the catalyst that gets grain markets out of their slumber and gets the speculators who have been very comfortable being short to say, you know, maybe we need to kind of lighten our risk here um, in the grain complex going into the growing season. Gotcha. Okay. Makes sense. So let's talk to me a little bit about a case of wheat takes off and runs, does what it's doing. Are we, is that opening the door for uh, funds to start looking at short cover? Yes. I mean, that's what I was just suggesting. Well, I mean, they're already starting short cover in wheat, but they, mm-hmm. they all, but they're all short. Every single, the same funds are short at the whole market. I mean, it's kind of like they're right. macro traders. So, when, so if you, if you say like, I'm going to go long the AI stocks, I'm going to short the grain markets. We don't just short wheat. You short them all. You short the you whole grain complex. Yeah. So if wheat's getting you uncomfortable and, and your boss says, guess what? We're reducing our exposure right now, our short exposure in the entire – get out, you know, reduce exposure by X amount in the grain complex. They're going to buy everything back if they, get, if they get sufficiently scared. So, yes, one leads to the other leads to the other. Obviously, whichever market is more fundamentally bullish will do better. Because they met with less selling, so it doesn't mean they all go up a similar percentage. Um, it may mean you know wheat goes up. Uh, you know, right now wheat's been leading, of course. Um, my suspicion is wheat leads. Corn will be the second best performer. I think right now, if you're looking at soybeans, they're probably the, the, the one that lags the most. But they're all they all would get an impact of short covering if the funds get sufficiently scared. And I think if you look at this six dollar area on uh, on Chicago Board of Trades SRW wheat. Uh, I mean, that's a big technical barrier that if we were to like to cross, we're almost crossing mm-hmm. it today, we're not quite, but almost, I think 597, something like that. But if we were to break through six on the charts, boy, I think that would get a lot of these algorithms and computer programs and funds um, feeling they're on the wrong side of the trade. So, so we're at a very um, important tipping point here that if we tip a little further, we could really set this thing off. It's something we've talked about for months. At some point, this is going to happen. Maybe, yeah. just maybe. You know, this is the this is this is uh, this is when it's going to happen. So, right on. Okay, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the weather here a little bit. Um, we've on the show we've talked about several things that that lead towards um, in that point towards um, you know cooling of of the oceans and you know temperatures and those kind of things. One of the things we've talked about quite, quite extensively on here is the, the Tonga volcano. And that was a, t- a volcano that went off in 2020. Uh, 2022, actually. And January, 2022. January 2022. 2022. Yeah. All right. So that put 70,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of um, water vapor in there. It was a VEI-5, right? Six. Okay, so it was a big one. So had that been on on above the ground, we would have had a whole different scenario. We would have had nuclear winter of sorts type of things. You know, it really cooled the things off. But but then in retrospect, you put in one of the biggest greenhouse gases on the planet, which is obviously water vapor, into the air. And it see, we've seen um, record temperatures around the world in certain spots. Weather patterns have changed because of that. And we had one that just went off locally in Indonesia, Mount. Rowing. What is how you say it? Mount Rowing. There you go. Mount Rowing went off to not to the level. It was a VEI four, right? And so it's it's uh not quite to where globally it's gonna have an issue, but locally obviously in Indonesia and that part of Asia, you're gonna see some 
some issues there. Then you have the bull for gyre effect, which is the water uh, up in uh, around Greenland that's spinning around. And um, it's a big pool of fresh water that reverses from time to time and dumps fresh water back into the ocean, which desalinates the ocean and it causes cooling because you know the, the, the currents slow down. I guess so as you're looking at all these things, kind of long story short is got a couple of volcanoes that we're watching and what they've done there. And then you've got this bull for gyre effect based on scientific research that we're overdue for that. And should be some time between now and 2025 that you should see something like that happen. And they're starting to see those signs of it slowly making changes. So I guess long story, long question short here, Sean, as you're looking at all the weather effects that you see happen right now, looking at your models. Well, well, your like I want to that. understand how, how to know if, our, if the volcano is really going to make a difference or not. Any volcano can make a difference locally. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a global weather impact. The only way you're going to have a global weather impact is you need to have a volcano that is identified as a volcanic explosivity index of six or higher. It can go as high as eight. And it's like the Richter scale. Every time you go from four to five or five to six, the impact is is gargantuanly larger. Okay. Um, Tonga was a VEI. Six and the way you measure this is it has it has to do with column height, meaning it has to be at least thirty kilometers. The column has to go at least thirty kilometers into the stratosphere in order to get high enough to deposit these aerosols so that they stay there for years. If they don't get high enough, then they come right back out. Okay, so thirty kilometers. Ruang is was twenty kilometers, not high enough. And then the next thing is. It, even if it is high enough, does it does it just uh, deposit enough aerosols? I mean, does it put enough concentration of aerosols in the stratosphere to change the chemistry of the stratosphere? In, in the case of Ruang, not even close because that was a sulfur dioxide uh, volcanic eruption. I mean, not even close. Even if it was a thirty kilometer to put enough sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere to make a huge difference. Now Tonga did. Water vapor wise, uh, and that was what water vapor is still floating around. Typically, aerosols can stay in the stratosphere, at least sulfur dioxide we know stays in the stratosphere typically around three years to five years. We're assuming water vapor aerosols do the same thing. Remember, we haven't had an, a, an underwater volcano eruption like this in a thousand years, so we don't have a whole lot of to go by. But I, we, unfortunately, uh, right. NASA yeah. measures this, and I measure it every day. I actually, it's a weekly report, um, and and we can see you know, when is it precipitating out. So far, the water moisture is still up there. Um, the speculation is it would be up there for three to five years. I'm assuming that means it'll it'll be up there through 2025, and then we'll start to see it precipitate. I will say, some parts of the stratosphere we're starting to see early signs of precipitation coming out, uh, just a little bit. So I think that five year window is it looks to me given that i'm already starting to see a few places uh that probably looks like it's going to be right so once that precipitates out we go back to a normal stratosphere again and we look for the next vei6 or higher most likely sulfur dioxide sulfur dioxide is exactly so so what is, what does water vapor do well when you pump the stratosphere with moisture you have the risk of massive storm formation where the teleconnections allow it. Look what just happened in Dubai. Underwater. Underwater. Never they've never yeah. seen anything like this in history. You know, the nine hundred inches of yeah. snow we had in California broke records. Um we've been seeing these extreme flooding events since Tonga because of that massive moisture source that's up there in the stratosphere, as you said, you know, it, it, it doubled the water the normal water vapor in the stratosphere in six hours. That's the first effect. Second effect, it's a it's the number one greenhouse gas in the world, meaning it's the number one uh, heating agent gas in the atmosphere by a long shot. So where the teleconnections say it's supposed to be hot, we've been seeing extreme record high temperatures. Uh, Brazil this past season, Argentina the season before. I mean, we just go on and on. You know, Texas last. I mean, we we've been seeing these record high temperatures, you know, periodically where the teleconnections allow it. So these are the weather extremes that are directly related to the to one of the greatest climatic volcanoes in a thousand years in terms of water vapor. 
and it's likely to continue to be impacting our climate for at least the next two years. It just so happens, as luck would have it, that this happens to also be the Gleisberg cycle. And the Gleisberg cycle is the completion of eleven of eight 11-year solar cycles or where all the planetary positioning goes back to square one and creates the upper airflow pattern historically for a one in 100-year drought in the Midwest. So, uh, you know, our, we identified that trend going back to the year 955. The three years that it, it, that it would be, if it's going to repeat, would be 23, 24, 25. So, so, so we have a situation we were already looking for uh, a warm, dry pattern due to Gleisberg cycle. But now we have Tonga, you know, that's that's adding an extra kicker that um, you know could set up for um, you know a very serious situation for um, you know for global agricultural su supply, and especially here in the U.S. We still feel the best bet for that to happen is 2025. This year is an El Nino transferring to a La Nina. It's probably not going to be able to deliver a full-blown iceberg cycle. Historically, um, you, you, you typically kind of need to have the atmosphere at least in a neutral territory by the springtime to set up the atmosphere correctly. It doesn't mean it can happen. And there's some signposts we're watching to see that maybe this year it could happen. But if we have, if, you know, if we're to be, if we're asked today, you know, which year we think is more likely, we think 25 is because 25 would be a full blown neutral on Nina year. Um, Gleisberg cycle still in play. Tonga still in play. Um, and, uh, and remember we're also at the peak 18.6 year, uh, Earth mutation cycle, which is the five degree wobble every 18.6 maximum wobble as it rotates and wobbles around its axis. Whenever you get that maximum wobble, is when you also are in a, uh, uh, it, it also creates the, 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 the gravitational um, forces that tend to also increase the potential for hot, dry weather. So, so everything is lining up for 2025 to be that year. Uh, we're, we're not saying 24 can't be it, but we think there's too many things that have to. Ha Doesn't mean it's going to be a great year for weather. We don't think it's going to be. We think we're going to have a lot of problems. But the, a Gleisberg is different. You know, a, a VEI six is not a VEI five. A Gleisberg is not a, a a tough crop year. It's a major crop problem, and we don't we think the odds for that at this point right. remains 2025. Time will tell. Well, in, in the next. 45 days as we approach early June. Well, you know, some of these other variables that would absolutely have to fall into play to make this a, a, a greater risk, we, we'll be able to see whether that's actually happening or not. So. Okay. Well, a lot of stuff to pay attention to, Sean. So folks want to reach out to you and, and subscribe to your newsletter, which is an amazing newsletter. Um, um, our website is hacket, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, -T, advisors.com. Information on there, uh, sample reports, such and forth and so on about what we do. Our Twitter page, at Faradex11, F as in Frank, E-R-I-D-E-X-11. We sometimes post interviews and tidbits on there about our cycle work, statistics and correlations to see if the way we look at the world of agriculture and the future of pricing might be of value to those that are listening and watching your show. Right on. I'm kind yeah, of uh, speaking I finished going up here last week, soon? Casey, and I'm kind of on on uh, you know going into the quiet phase mm -hmm. as farmers get out in the field and plant and growing season. So I don't really have a whole lot on the books here for the next few months, mm -hmm. which is typical. So I look, but I think I start getting more fired up later in the summer. Right. But if you know things can change overnight, all of a sudden I get something, but. Right now, it um, looks like I'm going to be a little more homebound sure. uh, uh, for the next, uh, you know, few months. So, right on. Okay. Well, good stuff, Sean. Sounds Thanks good. for being on the podcast. Forward, we'll talk to you again later this week. Right on. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast. You can check out the video version of the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. You can also find stuff over on TikTok at Moving Iron Podcast as well. You go to movingironllc.com for everything Moving Iron related, <clears throat> and you can find a lot of good information there. If you're in the market to rent a combine or an ADAR or something like that, give me a shout, 308-225-3305, or you can send me an email at movingironpodcast at movingironpodcast.com. 
and I'll get you some information on that. I have a couple combines, and I have uh, some tractors as well. Uh, if you're looking for an extra machine or something for this cup coming, uh, wheat harvest or some tillage work you may be doing as well. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour with Sean Hackett. Let's move some iron, folks. Out. Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash movingiron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is proudly provided by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century.